Hey everyone, it's Jamie. I thought it would be fun to end the year with some of my all-time favorite episodes of Murderish. This episode in particular is very near and dear to my heart because it features an extra special guest, none other than true crime TV legend Josh Mankiewicz of Dateline NBC. My good friend Carrie Martin and I got together with Manx and recorded this episode a few years ago. The three of us talked about murder, relationships, Dateline episodes, Scott Peterson, childhood, and Eminem even came up during our conversation. Something else happened during the episode that Manx had no idea was coming. And well, you'll have to listen to find out what happened. I hope you enjoy this episode of Murderish because it's truly one of my all-time favorites. Hey kids, this is Josh Mankiewicz from Dateline. You're listening to Murderish, but don't worry, listening to the show doesn't make you a murderer. It just makes you murder-ish. All right, guys, we're here together. Finally, we've been talking for a while about putting this together. Here in the studio with my good friend, Carrie Martin of White Wine True Crime. Hey, guys. And I'm also here with the one, the only, Josh Mankiewicz from Dateline. I'm feeling particularly murderish today. (laughs) Yes. I love it. And you're on the right podcast. Yes, absolutely. So anyway, I was so looking forward to this. We have so much to talk about. I want to get right into it. I'm curious. I have some curious questions for you, Manx, because I've been a fan of yours forever. I wanted to know when the opportunity to work on Dateline came up for you, did you already have an interest in true crime or was it just kind of a good gig to have? And it was a great gig to have. It was 1995. I had uh, I'd been a uh, I'd been a political reporter for most of my career. I started off in Washington covering Congress at ABC News back in the uh, mid to late 70s. I was not on camera then, but I was still covering Congress. Um, then I went on the air in D.C. at the ABC affiliate, where I also covered a lot of local politics. Then I went back to ABC News as a correspondent. I covered the 80 and 84 presidential campaigns, and I did some general assignment stuff, too. I was in. Remind us who was running for president at that time. Well, Reagan won in 1980, and he got reelected in 84. And I wasn't on the Reagan campaign either of those years. I was on other challenging campaigns. I was on... Uh, John Connolly's campaign. He was governor of Texas, and he ran and uh, and and didn't win. But he was kind of an early front runner. It was fun to be uh, following that campaign around. They had a lot of money at that point. Uh, but Reagan eventually won pretty easily in 1980, and then very easily reelected in '84. I was on that. I was on the road all that year with Mondale, who was running against him, and Geraldine Ferrara, who was running for vice president that year. So it was fun. I mean, I'd seen saw the whole country, you know, uh, mm-hmm. crisscrossing back and forth, and of course you never get any sleep. Campaigns are fun if you're if you're a reporter, if you're a young reporter. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> so then um, I left ABC News in 1986, and I went to WCBS in New York. Uh, the local station owned by CBS, which uh, I started off covering um, Long Island, which was a lot of fun. Uh, And then I was political reporter there for the last four years I was there. Then I came to Los Angeles where I was political reporter at KCAL. And then I left to go to a program that Fox was just starting. Not There was no Fox News Channel. This was Fox Network Mm -hmm. called Front Page, which was their uh, first attempt – or not first attempt, but their, their, their then attempt at a news magazine. Uh, and it, it was fun to do, uh, but it didn't last. Hmm. Uh, and we were on the air. I'm not even sure we were on the air for a full year, but pretty close to that. Hmm. And then there was a long period of time, which I was sort of getting paid under terms of that contract, and I wasn't doing anything because we were kind of waiting to find out whether that was going back on the air, whether we were going to retool it or do something else. And, like, you know, I, I was – getting kind of restless. How do I sign up for something like that? You know, I, you'd think it would be great, but actually like I, I was kind of like I, I really wanted to start working again. So yeah. I had turned down Dateline to go to Fox mm. in another brilliant career move of mine. And I went back to Dateline and they were fortunately still expanding. So I sort of took the job that I had turned down earlier. But Dateline wasn't doing true crime then. Oh. Uh, so Dateline was kind of the uh, the cooler, slicker 60 minutes back then. We were doing Four or five stories an hour, some of them, you know, eight to 15 minutes long, some of them one to two minutes long. I don't know if you remember, there was a thing called the Dateline Timeline where they would say, you know, what year was it? This happened, this happened, this happened, and they'd give you a choice. That was very popular. Uh, there was, we did a thing where, uh, where we pitted a 
money manager, a guy who picked stocks against a chimpanzee. Who picked stocks? Pick stocks. Pick stocks by awesome. grabbing Sounds at like them. Sounds like me when I pick stocks, mm-hmm. and, but I don't really pick stocks. And this was not just the one thing that we did. It was over a you know a period of some months. We'd go back and, and see how they were doing. And the weird thing was the chimp actually did okay. <laughs> like if you had invested ten thousand dollars with with uh, Larry the chimp, you'd have made some money. So we did some fun things like that. And there was some investigative stuff, and there were some profiles, and, and there was some sort of news you can use stuff. I remember pieces about how, parenting and things we did. Mm-hmm. I, I'd agree great piece about people who feed their kids dessert for breakfast. Because, oh, I was raised that way. Because they're, chocolate chip cookies. Well, so that's it's, what's wrong with you. There's chip. a lot of things wrong with me. Yeah, that, that barely makes the top 100. <laughs> but uh, but uh, chocolate chip cookies have just as many calories at 8 in the morning as they do at 8 at night. You know? Right. I yeah. mean, you know, if your kid's going to eat it, better to have it earlier. Much as the, pancakes, too, burn right? It off. Yeah. There's probably something to that. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, I mean, we didn't start doing crime until like 2000. Six or 2007. So we've only done it a little more than 10 years. And when they originally told me, you know, we're going to start doing these crime hours or these crime stories, they were, when, they, when they started, they weren't even hours. I didn't want to do it. I, I really didn't want to do it. And, and I resisted. And Keith told me recently, Keith Morrison told me that they were very worried. Our bosses in New York were very concerned that I was dragging my feet about crime because they really wanted to like get us all on board with this. I love that you're so successful, get everything. <laughs> I know it's kind of. It's like by accident, you just yeah, you just by accident, the like you've not wanted it. to do no, anything no. that ended up making you successful and popular. No, and I know. Here, you, and here you are. I know. I know. I've I mean, I'm sure it happens. Yeah. I've fought my success every every step of the way. Yeah, I mean, who knew that it was that the, the true crime was going to be such a big thing? I certainly it didn't even occur to me. You know, all I remember was they were saying, "Oh, you know, the audience really they, they seem to really respond to this, and people really like it, and they're great stories." And as time went by, you know, I remember I remember absolutely the first crime story that I did, uh, which was in uh, Reno, it was about the disappearance of Brianna Dennison whose mom had a birthday the day before yesterday, and I was just talking to her. So, oh, so, so still, you still keep in touch. Oh, yeah, with a wow. lot of those people, but definitely, definitely Bridget. And uh, if you're a reporter, reporting is reporting. Stories are stories. Writing is writing. And I'm not sure that if they had said to me, we're going to change Dateline to make it like um, Entertainment Tonight, mm-hmm. I'm not sure I could have followed that. But I was wrong about true crime. It ended up touching people, the audience, in a way that a lot of the other things we were doing didn't. And people, as you know as well or better than I do, the two of you, I mean, people have opinions about this that are far more fervent and determined and well-educated than their opinions about anything, about, you know, politics or the Mm -hmm. weather or sports. I mean, people really, really care about this. They're passionate about it. And I really think, I mean, I see in my own download numbers for the podcast, and I'm sure you see the same thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is largely women. Women, I would say, you know, I'd venture to say that it's probably just under 90 percent. You know, it's, it's mostly women who are the audience of True Crime TV, podcasts and what do you why do you think that is I don't know the answer to that I uh I mean it's um I mean certainly when we all were at CrimeCon together this year the yeah. audience was women I mean what 90 something percent women it, it was wasn't even the close first year too and if there were guys all of them look like how I would look at the Super Bowl. Like, nobody was into it. Like, like, why, right. yeah, like, 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 oh, yeah, no, right. no, I talked to a lot of guys like, who said, like, yeah, let me, let me come here. Yeah. 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 And I always find it special, like, you know, in my social media groups and things like that, when I do have a man who's very engaging, you know, after we, you know, do an episode or, the, or a, you know, a crime happens and they want to talk back and forth and talk theories, and I'm like, oh, there's a guy who's interested because mm-hmm. it really is just so overwhelmingly women. And I I have a little bit of a theory on it because I think about it all the time. I don't know why I'm kind of obsessed with it, but it might be kind of the same reason why women love reality TV. We're curious creatures. Mm -hmm. We want to know all the details. We also want to know how other people live. We want the tea. Mm -hmm. We want to know how other people live. And so we want to get into the mind of these killers, understand it, dissect it. We're curious. We're nosy. I don't know. I mean, my theory is this. These stories, particularly that we do on Dateline, they're not really about murders. Mm -hmm. They're about relationships. Mm -hmm. I agree. Women are always more interested in the details of relationships of why they went right and why they went wrong than men are. 
men frequently can't even like tell you if they were forced to. They couldn't tell you like this didn't work or why or why this is working. Men don't think about that as much as women do. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying women, men don't think about it at all, but they don't think about it as much as women do. Women are very interested in why things don't work out. Or yeah. so if somebody you know says those two are wrong for each other, those two should stay away from each other. That's probably a woman. Agreed. Yeah. So I'm a business consultant for work, and I always say that I don't dissect the reports that I'm paid to analyze the way I'll dissect a text from a guy. Oh, yeah. my gosh. Such a good point. I mean, it's so true because it's 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 jogged your interest. Mm-hmm. I mean, you want to dissect and it. Screenshot it. it. You send it to your friends so they can dissect it. Talk about it for days, weeks, yeah, I, months. I talk, we talked about this. Uh, I talked about this a little bit at CrimeCon, which is like, you know, I hope that no one in the audience is ever touched by violent crime, Mm -hmm. but almost everybody has a relationship that didn't work out. Right. Almost everybody either was betrayed or felt betrayed or felt like they might be betrayed or betrayed somebody else or was accused of betraying somebody else. I mean, those are all tremendously common themes. I mean, we don't do stories very often about excessively bloody or violent crimes or random crimes or serial killers or sex crimes. Almost all the the stories at Dateline are the stories of of families and of relationships and of decisions that you could see yourself being part of or couldn't see yourself being part of. Like, like, you know, okay, I mean, I get getting divorced. I don't get killing my ex. You know, that's the kind of thing that we end up doing. And that's the kind of question that we sort of want people to ask themselves when they're watching Dateline. I understand, I guess, snapped (laughs) because I'm very passive and bubbly and easygoing, but I've definitely had my fair share of bad relationships, not physically, but emotionally, where it's like some of the things that come out of my mouth and that I say to this person are so just like, I don't talk to people that way. But you tend to find in relationships, yeah, you can... I'm not saying I get it. I wouldn't go to that point where I But you can hear some somebody. understanding of it that that in Josh you had mentioned this in, in in previous conversations regarding the Jody Arias case. Yes, a lot of people think and probably for good reason that she's a psychopath and she's evil and what she did was disgusting and deliberate and I believe a lot of those things, but and it's not an excuse, but he treated her very poorly and he got her to a point where she snapped. And I'm not going to say she snapped and it's a crime of passion. I don't believe that it was. But I do think that he aided in her kind of going crazy. And it's and, not his and, fault. He's the victim. Yeah, no, no. Um, I mean, nobody, I mean, but no he amount treated of, her terribly. He, 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 no amount of, true, and no amount of treating somebody badly is an excuse to, to kill them. No. But, uh, I mean, unless it's, you know, self-defense or something like that, which I think is not, uh, was, was, was not borne out to be the case by the trial in, right. in that particular case. But that's sort of the perfect example of what I'm talking about because that's not really – the Jody Arias, Travis Alexander case, that's not really the story of a murder. That's the story of a relationship that ended in a murder. Right, right. And and that's why people were drawn to it. It isn't because people were fascinated with someone getting killed. But the details of the backstory of what led up to that, that's clearly what drew people in and made people – I mean when I covered that trial, I met some people – who worked in an office in, like, Michigan or somewhere, and they had taken their annual vacation, these two women who sat next to each other, like in some insurance company, and flown to Phoenix and waited in line to get into the trial. Mm -hmm. It was the first time that I'd ever seen the criminal justice system as some kind of spectator sport. And before that, I know it had happened with the with, with Casey Anthony yeah, when there were course. these Florida. giant crowds yeah. there. Those two were sort of the first time, and I didn't cover that. Dennis Murphy did, but I remember seeing it on television, the, the lines to get into the courthouse I think they would in have Florida. lotteries to yeah. see who could get in. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was, it was astonishing. Yeah. And again, with, with Jody Arias, and it'll happen again. I, I remember there was an expert in the, in the uh, Arias case who testified, I think on her side, don't hold me to that, I believe so, and uh, about some psychological defense uh, for what had happened. And that woman had written a book, and all of the people who saw themselves as advocates for justice in this case went online and gave her book terrible reviews. Mm. I'd never seen anything like that happen before. That sort of, you know, participation by the audience directly 
in the lives of someone associated with a criminal trial of which you were absolutely no part at all, except you were an interested spectator. And people just have such a visceral reaction to Jody, somebody like Jody Arias, Casey yeah. Anthony. So, well, I mean, especially with Jody and um, Travis, they're a good-looking couple. Yeah, they're the couple next door. But what also made it sensational, she was very brazen. And I don't know if you remember, Nancy Grace was very outspoken about her disdain for Jody. No. Yeah, I know. The one time Shocked. she was outspoken. That's not like Nancy. No, it's weird. And, and Jody would be tweet. I don't know how she was able to tweet, but she would tweet things at Nancy Grace based on comments. Nancy would make about Jody. I mean, it was just very interesting. The back and the forth, a prisoner and a reporter. I think she had a friend tweeting out, outside of that would make outside, the most sense. Who she was calling every day and and, and saying what the but what, Jody's what crafty. The tweet. <laughs> you don't uh, know. She is. And, and she only followed like you know like a dozen or so people, of which briefly I was one because I'd done a story on that. And I started I getting it. on Twitter. I started getting these. Uh, these uh, sort of hate messages from people, you know, how can you fight you? I, you know, I want you to unfollow her. I'm like, yeah, you're Listen, not. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm you covering, unfaced by that? I'm covering, yeah, of course. I'm like, I'm covering this story. I'm going to follow that's whoever I want. Boy. Yeah. Uh, that's exactly that right. Yeah. He really yeah. is. But yeah, it was, that was actually pretty interesting. And this is the same, the same kind of thinking that led people to go review that book. But look, I mean, Judy Arias and Casey Anthony were similar in a way. I mean, although one was convicted and one wasn't. Mm -hmm. But what clearly piqued the audience's attention, these were, these were sort of young, apparently, I say apparently, carefree young women who, you know, were sort of living the good life or at least living the life that they wanted to live without care for anyone else and either did get away with murder or appeared to be getting away with murder to some people or at least tried to get away with murder in this in the eyes of the audience mm -hmm. and uh and that you know that that sort of desire to see justice done is a very universal theme i think among our viewers and probably among viewers of all true crime broadcasts and podcasts and and tv shows which is you know people like seeing the system work correctly they do the other thing about that trial is it put juan martinez on the map, all mm -hmm. of a sudden, he was almost like a rock star, yeah, to a degree. And I remember he wrote a book, and then you know, having a true crime podcast, you'll have different publishers reach out to you, and he was one of them. And we got to interview him. And what I loved about our interview with with Juan was, I th you saw him on Larry King, you saw him going on all these different shows or radio or whatever it might be, getting asked the same redundant questions. And I think. For our podcast, it was just kind of silly where I was like, I don't think he understands yeah. who he's talking to. <laughs> no, I'm sure he did. And so I think he enjoyed the fact that he could laugh and kind of like let down his hair and he, he was a lot of fun. But I uh, think – On your podcast, every time he said something, you should have said, I object. You really right? should. That would have been so right? great. I didn't know you at Taste the time, but that would have been a great yeah. hint. Yeah. Um, afterwards. But it does. It puts these different prosecutors. I We actually just um, recently were asked to interview Jose Baez mm -hmm. about Aaron Hernandez. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it, it is. I mean, these yeah. people become, yeah, rock stars to a certain degree, much like you were at CrimeCon in yes. Nashville. Oh, yeah. and I want to talk about CrimeCon, but going back to your point uh, regarding Juan Martinez, I mean, the people like him, you know. Was, was he at CrimeCon this past year? No. no, but people talked about him. There was somebody that was involved in the case who was there, but mm -hmm. all people could talk about was Juan Martinez. Yeah. I mean, he's got his own cult following. Well, you know, because I, uh, of that case, the, the Jody Arias case was not my first Juan Martinez experience. Right, you said you knew uh, him before. He, we'd done a two-hour dateline on a uh, on a case that he had prosecuted several years earlier. A guy named Doug Grant, who was accused and convicted of killing his wife in Phoenix. He was a big nutritionist. And Juan was doing the same thing on that that he did in Jody Arias. I mean, he was a tiger in the courtroom. Mm -hmm. He was very entertaining. Very effective. And when I walked into the courtroom for Jody Arias, like they were just getting started. Like they hadn't actually, the judge was there, but hadn't actually hit the gavel yet. And he turns around, Juan turns around, he says to me, you never write. You never call. He goes, oh, well, I'm like, well, sorry. Here we are. Yeah. Here we are again. Yeah. That is awesome. Yeah. He seems like a funny guy. Um, yes. You brought up CrimeCon. Mm -hmm. And that's where I met you, Josh, which was I was so looking forward to that. We had so much fun. There's so much to talk about there. But 
I mean, what are your overall thoughts about CrimeCon? I mean, what do you like about it? Is there anything you don't like about it? I mean, what were your thoughts? I, I've never – I mean, the thing I liked about it was it was a chance to sort of meet the audience. Mm-hmm. And that's the audience. I mean, it's not like – there. I don't think there was anybody there who heard us speak, the Dateline panel, and thought to themselves, huh, Dateline. Yeah. I should check that show out. <laughs> right. I mean, like, uh, like, that's our audience. They're already watching. They know everything. Yeah. Well, you had been to the first one. I was. In Indianapolis, just you. And it was because of the reaction there, which was a much smaller Mm -hmm. crowd, that I said to our bosses, like, we got to go. And you got to make everybody else go. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was wonderful. I loved meeting everybody. I can honestly say, easily say, I've never encountered that kind of reaction anywhere. Um, Really? I mean, mean, not just – it's not just recognition. It's not really being like a rock star. It's not that they think you're some celebrity. It's that they feel like you're all on the same team. Totally. You know, like we're all part of the same effort. Yes. I mean, it's less like a, it's less like a rock concert and more like, you know, Tony Robbins or something. You know, <laughs> like we're all point. in this together is the right. feeling that a lot of those people have. And I thought that was great. I mean, it was, it was sort of great to feel this kind of synergy with the audience and they, they know everything about every case. They do. I mean, people will say to me, you know, on this and this case, why didn't the San Diego police use Luminol? Like, uh, that was four years ago. I'm not sure I remember. But, I mean, they've really dissected everything. Right. Well, and I think people expect you, because of who you are and the show that you've been on for so darn long, they expect you to be an expert on all cases. Right. And it's weird, and I'm sure you and get I, this too, I, Carrie. And I am when we're doing them. Right. And I'm sure, absolutely, yeah. you do a deep dive on every single one, and you yeah. know it like the back of your hand. But even a little bit being a podcaster and having a true crime podcast, sometimes you get the feeling that listeners just assume you know everything about every case and that you're some sort of like soft expert. And I use that term very loosely because obviously I'm not. I'm a mom, three kids. I run a business with my husband has nothing to do with true crime. Mm -hmm. But you kind of get that feeling sometimes that just because, you know, you have the podcast, but especially in Josh's case, I can imagine that people just want you or think that you're the expert on every well, single case. constantly saying to me, you know, what happened in the mystery at Crystal Cove? I'm like, yeah. uh, <laughs> which one was that? And they're like, the guy who killed his wife. I'm like, I need Ooh, a little, I need a little I more, need more than more. that. Yeah. Even with podcasts, I can't remember. I'll have people quote different things I've said or ask about a certain – the subject that we covered, and it's the same thing. I remember one time, I think it was like Entertainment Tonight, they were asking George Clooney and Matt Damon, like, okay, which one of you said this? And they were giving them movie quotes, and they couldn't remember all their movie quotes because you're right. You immerse yourself in the project at the time, but then you move on. You move on, yeah. And you forget. And and one case bleeds into the next for me sometimes, and it's it's embarrassing sometimes. I'll be talking to somebody, and I'll be bringing up a, a fact in the case, and I'm talking about the totally wrong case because I listen to so mm-hmm. much truth crime in podcasts. I watch so much true crime. I read so much true crime. It sort of like bleeds, you know, one into the next. And I've got the memory of like a 95 year old anyway. Does that make your husband nervous? Well, I have told him and it's not a threat ish, but I do think that I know how to commit the perfect murder. I mean, I'm just saying I I just let him know that I don't threaten him. Right. I just softly. It's like a soft threat, though. It's just, I mean, I, it's just out there. You just yeah. laid it just on the table and the, walked away. Just yeah. in the ether. Yeah. yeah. I may have given him like uh, exact details as to what I would do, but I'm not trying to scare Which him. Which way would you go? Well, I mean, I kind of think that. Okay, this is going to sound so terrible. People are going to judge me so hardcore. I promise no. I won't ever murder him. Okay. Cr- true crime fans don't judge. Okay, good. You know, you're right. I mean, I think that I'll just go with what I think uh, Scott Peterson did to his wife. I think he strangled her, and which is why there was no mess in the house. And if you're trying not to get caught and leave a lot of mess and evidence behind, maybe strangulation is a good way to go. Right. But for a woman to physically be able to strangle their husband and your husband, I've seen pictures, good looking guy. Thank you. And Lawn Kings, is that what it is? He's the Lawn King. I'm his Lawn Queen. Shout out to the Lawn King. Yeah. Lawn King? Yeah. What, what? I mean, he's yeah, he's got muscles and a nice spot. I mean, you would have to sedate him somehow. Which I've thought about. I mean, no, I haven't thought about it. <laughs> no, of course not. I'm just not. saying, since you just brought it up, You've Harry, hypothetically thought yeah, about hypothetically, it. Yeah, hypothetically, I've thought about it. Right. I'd have to sedate him because he's a big dude. He's bigger than me. So maybe a little sedation. Um... I'm busy that day, by the way. Oh, God, because I always thought- I'm free. 
Thank you. I'm always free. You're my girl because I always thought Josh would help me bury a body, but he's not going to admit that. No, he'll just cover the case after. He doesn't like to get his hands dirty. Um, True that you're thinking of a new slogan for your husband's business. Can we all just get a lawn? (laughs) Which, by the way, you can. Use. Use free of charge. Okay, yeah. hold on. Will I reach in my? Do I need to give you some cash no, no, for that? It's good. Because that's all yours. Genius. All okay. yours. All right. I feel Can a commercial coming on. on. That is very funny. Yeah. So my husband and I have a synthetic grass business called Lawn Kings, and then we have Titan Turf Supply. But that's perfect. Okay, I'm going to let him know. He's going to love that. Checks in the mail, Josh. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's that's probably the way I would go. I would do a little sedation. If it, let's just hypothetically, if it was my husband, uh, strangulation. I don't want to leave a mess. I'd somehow have to move the body, which I haven't really thought about. And I don't want to sound like I've given this too much thought. Um, but I may have to pull his teeth out, in case the body's ever found. Just saying. Cut off his fingers, or that. I mean, that's well, in both really vile. That not you thought of that, Carrie. I mean, I would never think of that. But yeah. All of this, I think, kind of illustrates one point that sort of is uh, common in a lot of the stories we do is that there isn't any premeditation, you know, or there isn't sufficient premeditation. People don't realize we leave an electronic fingerprint as we move around. Mm-hmm. There's lots of surveillance or I always say, lots of security cameras that uh, – uh, that record people's movements that people are not aware of. Mm-hmm. See no evil um, is a show know, on investigation right. discovery. We you know, make solve cases that way. Additionally, if your cell phone is suddenly off for the first time for three hours, for the yep. first time in mm-hmm. 12 years, that on the other suggests hand, you might be up to something. So true. And on the other hand, if you're like Scott Peterson, you're going to, you know, you damned if you do and you damned if you don't. If he would have, you know, turned his phone off, he's damned. But also he made that fake, in my opinion, fake phone call to his wife and left a voice message. Hi, honey. Oh, hi, beautiful. Mm -hmm. I'm coming home. La, 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 la. Like any husband ever leaves that kind of message for his wife. Right. But so it's kind of like you'd have to play it perfectly. And I don't know what that means, but um, you can't turn your phone off, but you don't want to sound too eager and fake. And some phones have GPS. And so they're able to track and see where you went. Yep. Most phones do. I didn't cover the that story that was uh, that was Keith Morris. I don't know the details of mm. of that very well. I did a little tiny bit on that right at the end. Most of the people that we do stories about are first time murderers. Yes, and they either get caught because they make some mistake that they weren't thinking about, or they don't get caught because in, in some cases they're just phenomenally lucky. Mm. Like the department loses one piece of evidence, mm-hmm. or. The security camera, which would be recording them buying bleach trash bags and duct Didn't tape, work. isn't working that day. Right. Or I know right after Hurricane Katrina, a lot of people were out committing crimes because, one, evidence had already got washed away or there was so much havoc. I guess that's the time to do it. Yeah, I, go, I would imagine. So it's the time to steal a TV or do whatever you're going to do. Mm-hmm. Kind of like the, um, the after the Rodney King uh the riots. Beating the riots. And people mm-hmm. were just going in. I remember seeing that in the news. People looting. walking in and looting and just running out with a 30-inch TV or whatever it was. And I mean, yeah. it was crazy. I work um, – I'm a consultant for 7-Eleven and we had franchisees who remember – Shout out. Who, yeah, to the Sev who remember during all the turmoil that they would literally sleep in their office and protect it because they were open 24-7. Yep. And just in case they got rioted and looted, and we don't necessarily, I mean, I'm sure they have insurance, but yeah, they would sleep in the office. I would just like to say that I am the only person here that is old enough to remember when that company actually was open from 7 to 11. Oh. The seven, and which is where the name must have come from. Seven Eleven in Washington D.C., the one that was near our house, so was open at seven in the morning and closed at eleven at night. Going back to your youth, because yes. I am fascinated by I'm, what kind of, I guess, child you were. So we were talking this morning because I was like, I feel like Josh went to college, but I don't remember where. So then I came across it when I was googling you today. Which, by the way. The searches for Josh Mankiewicz are so funny. Yeah, what's Josh with Mankiewicz that? gay, Josh Mankiewicz stroke. Josh Mankiewicz net worth, actually, I did pop on because I wanted to see Which you know is exactly where we we're going correct. to lunch today. Yeah. We know exactly right. how much yeah. you have paying. in your bank account because of that. Yes, yeah. that's good. 100%. So you graduated the year after I was born. Really? <laughs> yeah, 1977. Uh, Was mm-hmm. it Haverford? Haverford. Haverford in Pennsylvania. It's in Philadelphia, yeah. So tell us a little bit like about you growing up. I know you kind of were brought up in the spotlight, but I'm curious what kind of kid you were. I was very small for my age, 
for a long time uh, until I was about like in like, I don't know, like probably ninth or 10th mm-hmm. grade. I wasn't a good athlete. I was always the new kid. We went, I went to seven elementary schools because we, we moved around a lot. So none of that is a particularly good recipe for having a lot of friends growing up. So I was sort of, you know, bookish and studious and kind of a class clown now and then, which I could see that. Sadly, I never got rid of that. <laughs> uh, but yeah, we we started in, the, in, in here in Los Angeles. We moved to Peru because my dad was in the Peace Corps then. Then back to Los Angeles to a different part of the city. Then to D.C. So by the time I was about nine years old, I lived in, in D.C. Mm. And then I lived there all through high school, and I went to college in Philadelphia. And then I came back to D.C. and, and worked there after college. That's where my parents were. But L.A. was sort of always home because all my other relatives except my parents were, were, were here. But, uh, yeah, I, um, I read a lot. I watched a ton of television growing up. I certainly watched my share of crime dramas growing up, which uh, – I, I was uh, uh, the which, TVs black and white back then. Oh yeah, they're black yeah. and white, and they had to you, you had to adjust Don't the rabbit, rabbit ears, ears yeah, on the yeah. top. Oh yeah, my dad used to uh, every night. My dad, I could hear my dad yelling my name from my room when I was doing my homework, and I would have to come all the way downstairs to where he was watching TV because he believed that only I could adjust the rabbit ears on the top of the TV. Like that that was some like black art that only kids understood. And I remember seeing him, no, no, like you just move them until you <laughs> like the picture and then you take your hands off. That's really pretty much it. Or, He's like, no, 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 I can't do that. You have to do that. But it's kind of like me trying to use Snapchat. I go to my kids. What What do I do? I don't know how to I do this. I still or, haven't figured you know, it out. Yeah, it's like the, I'm just hoping it'll the go away curve soon. is very steep with uh, Snapchat. But it, I, it's kind of like that. Like that was a technology back in the day where he just thought my young son will understand it and do it better than I can. Yes. And I can only – you know, that's kind of how I am when I'm trying to use like my Mac or get on Snapchat. My kids are like, Mom – Geez, like, gosh, it's not that hard. I'm like, it actually is very hard. Yeah, I don't it's, get it. Yeah, so it's do it all the time. <laughs> I, know, I don't, don't know how do to use. It. I don't know how to use Snapchat. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like how to, I don't really know how to do anything. I don't really know how to do anything except Twitter. I, I find Facebook sort of necessary, but incredibly cumbersome yeah. and difficult to use. The gram and uh, Twitter is where it's at. Right. I have most. Well, I can't say that. I used to really not be into Facebook. I was just kind of like, eh, but. Now that I have the podcast, you know, I have a Facebook group and that's my most intimate setting to like Which get I'm to know. part of. You know what? Can we just stop here? The day that Josh Mankiewicz entered my Facebook group is when I became a star. I mean, in my own mind, in my own you mind, You were already course. a star. But I was like, Josh is a part of my Facebook group and you should have seen everybody was so excited. And he pops in yeah. every now and then with his People geek witty out. Comments. That's why I love to tag Josh and stuff. If... They, if I think I posted the picture when we went to brunch and people were commenting how cool Josh was. So then I tagged him in it because I knew you would respond. Sure. You love stuff like that, but people like lose, uh, they lose, lose their, their shit. shit. Yeah, it's okay. You can say cast. shit on the podcast. It's fine. Oh, it's that kind of podcast. Oh, right. oh yeah. it's that kind of podcast. Yeah. Trust me. And uh, we probably are going to the strip club for lunch afterwards, so totally. it's fine. Yes. <laughs> I'll take my employee ID. <laughs> That's your Get retired, a 10% discount fine. on the buffet. <laughs> You wouldn't serve yourself a plate of high-quality food and then serve your best friend a plate of junk. So why do that to your dog? As man's and woman's best friend, they deserve the freshest, most nutritious food available. Nom Nom delivers fresh food that is perfectly personalized for your dog's needs. Nom Nom is made with real, whole food that you can see and recognize. They make it a point to be filler and additive-free to prevent your furry friend from experiencing bloating and low energy. Simply put, Nom Nom is science-based, real food for your dog. Each recipe is not only packed with nutrients, but it's crafted by board-certified nutritionists. And if you think that providing your dog with the highest quality food couldn't get any better, wait until I tell you about how easy it is to get your hands or paws on. Nom Nom is shipped free straight to your door. Your dog gives you their absolute best every day, so they deserve the same from you. Starting around $2.40 per meal, Nom Nom makes it easy for you to feed your dog deliciously and nutritiously. My dogs aren't just my friends, they're a part of my family, and it makes me feel so good to spoil them with better nutrition. We want our dogs to have long, healthy lives, so it's essential that the food we feed them is good for their digestion and immune systems. 
Nom Nom is the best choice for my dogs, but if your dog's tail isn't wagging within 30 days, Nom Nom will refund your first order. With Nom Nom's money back guarantee, you have nothing to lose. No fillers, no nonsense, just Nom Nom. Go right now for 50% off your no risk two week trial at trynom.com slash murderish. Spelled trynom.com slash murderish for 50% off. Trynom.com slash murderish. Hey, it's Jamie, host of Dirty Money Moves Women in White Collar Crime a podcast that dives deep into stories about female con artists. In season one of Dirty Money Moves, we investigated a woman I met a few years ago, Mary Carol McDonald, who went from Hollywood TV executive to prolific scam artist. Mary Carol's scam story even has ties to the Michael Jackson scandal. It's a wild tale you have to hear about to believe. Recently, we launched season two of Dirty Money Moves, featuring another shocking scam story. This time, we're diving deep into Tara Lee, a woman who used babies and vulnerable people to get her dirty hands on millions of dollars. In season two, you're going to hear directly from some of Tara's victims and people who knew her. Their story shed light on what made this con artist one of the most hated women in America. Imagine being approved to adopt a baby, only to find out that baby never even existed. Listen to Dirty Money Moves on iHeart, Spotify, or any podcast app. So I kind of wanted to know, Josh, like if you had a do-over in life, if you weren't working at Dateline and you could choose anything, what would you be doing as a career if you could do anything? I'd be, I'd be a correspondent for Dateline. Got it. So I you mean, love this, it that much. Oh, yeah. This is the thing I always wanted to do. I mean, I'm not That's saying cool. I grew up thinking to myself I want to cover murders for a living, yeah. but I definitely wanted to be a reporter. I mean, I grew up watching Walter Cronkite every single night oh, at, okay. at dinner with my parents. And then at 7.30, the, the newscast would be over. My dad would turn off the TV, and we would talk about what had just happened. Oh, that's neat. That was, that I like was, that. That is cool. That was dinner for me from when I was about seven or eight years old until way after college. Didn't you used to pick up Sam Donaldson suits? I did. Well, that was my that was my first job when I worked at ABC so cool. News in the middle of the night and mm-hmm. uh, on the assignment desk. And yeah, I used to take phone messages and you know distribute the assignment sheet to everybody's desk and stuff. And then uh, one day I had to uh, pick up Sam's suit from the cleaners. And then when I gave it to him, he said, "Thanks, Josh," which was like some indication he knew my name, which was very thrilling. Which was the day you became a star. That's right. That's right. <laughs> one of the things I remember you mentioning um, when we were having breakfast at the con, uh, you had said that for a while they were trying to make your voice, I guess, very basic. When oh. when I started at ABC News as a correspondent, which was in 1982, they sent me to, um, I'm thinking, easily $50,000, maybe more, wow. uh, worth of, of voice lessons with a very expensive, very well-known voice coach in New York uh, named Lillian Wilder, who's not with us anymore. Uh, and who had done a lot of very famous people, not just on the air, but also a lot of politicians. Her waiting room was like this who's who of America, all these people that she'd helped. And she um, she wanted to train me to sound more like an FM DJ. Ugh. And she wanted no. she wanted me, and I believe ABC News wanted me to have a voice. See, that, he can already do it. It sounded like he everyone else. And I did the best I could because I was new, you know, and I wanted them to kind of like me. And... But this is the voice I went in with, and this is the voice I came out with. And now it's hilarious that people say, you know. Uh, Bill Hader does a great impression of you, and that broke. I think he was oh on, was it Conan? When we were it at was Con. Right, No, it was uh, Kimmel. It was right before. Kimmel. Uh, yeah, it was ABC. I can only imagine how thrilled the people at 2020 must have been. It was freaking <laughs> yeah. awesome. That guy's yeah, hilarious. Yeah, I think it did. It came out the Thursday night right before. I know, Con it was Con perfect in timing. Oh, I couldn't believe timing. it. It was great. Bill Hader did great. He nailed all of you guys. I wouldn't. I mean, I, I was, look, I'd heard his Keith imitation before. It's great. I thought his imitation of me was very good. It was. I would have told you before that, that it was not possible to do an imitation of Dennis Murphy. But clearly, I don't know what I'm talking about because Hader was perfect. He was dead on. Yeah. It was He's so He's my good. secret celebrity crash. Oh, my God. I love it. Him and um, not Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Fallon. I think he's freaking hilarious. And he's cute. Yeah. See, I like um, Bill Hader and Eminem. Those Eminem. are my two. Oh, Eminem. Mm. You know what I like about Eminem mm. is that he's intriguing. Rap. 
He, yeah, exactly. Well, not only because he's a rapper and I love rap, but I like that Eminem is just, he really doesn't give a lot of interviews. He doesn't mm-hmm. talk a lot. He just kind of fades into the back and does his thing. You don't hear In from Michigan. him a lot. And he makes you want more because yeah. you don't get enough of him, you know, which I, I always like. I do, too. I went to visit some friends in Detroit, and um, oh my God, one of their friends had a yacht, so we were on it for the day, and they were like, oh, there's Eminem's house, and we went by, I think it was Kid Rock had a house there, too, but it was like growing up in the slums of Detroit, yeah. and they were plentiful. You would think, like, okay, I work in L.A. or New York, but he's that's where his home is, and I think that's admirable. I do too, and he's still there. And yeah, and I, if you see pictures of his daughter, she's absolutely stunning. Really, I haven't seen oh, her she's in a gorgeous. long time. Yeah, I think she might be like twenty now. But okay, that makes me feel really old. I, I remember that, yeah. when Haley was a little girl, <laughs> right? <laughs> what the heck? Yeah. Okay, so Josh, you you had mentioned earlier that, and I correct me if I'm wrong, you have family in the nine oh nine. In the Inland Empire, I do. Um, I do. Yes. Okay, so um, so I'm a Inland Empire girl. A shout out to the 909, and I was so excited to hear that you had family out there. So when you go out there, like in order to blend in, let's say, do you wear like a flat bill hat, black socks, and drive a lifted truck? <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Josh Mikowitz wears yeah. a flat bill hat and that black alone. socks. Yeah, I got a, uh, I got my Ford F one fifty. Uh, yeah, my uh, my brother in law and his family live in um, in uh, Fontana, and my oh. wife my wife grew up in Pomona. Oh my gosh, that's really so, in the heart of the nine hundred nine. Like mom, it's really true. And my mom and all her family came from San Bernardino, which is where I was born. Right? Oh my gosh, we yeah. have more in common than I thought. Right? But if you were related, so you guys are like cousins. It's entirely possible. I'm going to do the DNA test, Josh. I don't know if you're willing to do it, I'm but ready. Uh, okay. Yeah, who knows what it'll prove? I'll read the results. Yeah, I'll be in his will. Yes, that's yeah. right. Good Sorry, news. Carrie. Yeah, you get some, get <laughs> some pocket fine. squares. Sorry, Carrie. Yeah. <laughs> get some pocket squares. Yeah, no, no, I think none of my mom's family lives in, um, in uh, San Bernardino anymore. I think they've all, they've all migrated uh, farther west, but they live in Ventura. They live near where you live now. Yeah, that's very close, like 40 minutes away. I can't imagine why anybody would move out of San Bernardino, though. Right? It's, it's so beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's gorgeous. Touristy town. And... Yeah. <laughs> I feel like Not... the IE is like becoming a thing. The IE? Yeah. I, I mean, but why is it becoming a thing when I already moved out? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe they're just waiting for you to leave. So much. They <laughs> I, I lived there for, I did, I think, a year and a half in Chino Hills. So. I, think, I, think, oh. I think once you left, like a lot of people felt there was no point in staying in the IE. <laughs> I think that was the Applebee's a, and the chilies. Yeah. I mean, it's true because then Josh entered my Facebook group, which made me a star. Mm-hmm. And then they were like, well, we've got to follow. Yeah. So I totally get it. Yeah. I get it. So also, I was curious at CrimeCon, uh, my friend Simone, shout out to War Baby from Murderous Miners. Hello, Simone. I love Simone. I'm going to see her in three weeks and we'll talk about that. A woman basically. And I'm, and I'm coming to that, right? What, you well, know, are you? you have you ever seen if I'm here? here, if I'm here what, was it during the week or is it on it's a weekend? A Saturday it's on a Saturday. At four. Okay, I might be able to do that. Yeah. Yeah, we're, right. we're going to hold you to that. Okay. Jo- and now that you're in my Facebook group, you can click yes on the invitation. Wow. All right, we can share an Uber. Sweet. <laughs> yeah, since you guys are kind of, you guys kind of cl- live somewhat close together ish. Um, I just, I was curious because when we were at Heather McDonald's comedy show together, there was a girl who basically stalked and accosted Keith Morrison yeah. while we were there. Yeah. Now, did he ever decide to file charges? <laughs> she was just, uh, I'd forgotten about that. This woman was very, very, very determined to what? Have a picture taken with she Keith. She was, it made me, and I don't get, like, a, I don't get an awkward feeling from a lot of things. You know, it, she made me feel so awkward. I mean, we were all sitting at a table, yeah. like a high top table. And this was in the middle of Heather's act. Totally. Yeah. Lights are out. People yeah. be quiet. Let's listen to what she's got yeah. to say. You know, this girl comes up and you could see her coming a mile away. At least I spotted her. I don't think any of you guys did. And I look over and I could tell she was like a Dateline groupie. Like she was all about who was at this table. Right. And she just zeroed in. She saw Josh. She saw Keith. And she was just like. Like mouth wide open the whole time she approaches the table and she's just pointing awkwardly at Keith like this. She's just like looking at it and he's just like, uh, did, did she, did he want her to, did she want him to she sign something? She wanted a picture yeah. and she basically forced him and he tried to give her the hint, uh, like, hey, let's do it later. The show. Yeah. yeah, he was kind of signaling with his hands. You know, Keith is really calm and cool and such a sweet guy, you know, but he was just kind of like, uh, kind of giving her hand gestures like, let's do this later. It's kind of rude. She was having none of it. She went behind him and forced him. Yeah, so right. <laughs> I can imagine that's if right. I were Keith, he, he would be thinking, okay, so now there's a camera in my face. So I guess right. I'm smiling now. I So they took a picture 
And then she accosted Josh a little bit. I don't but you were a little that. more. I don't remember that. She came up to you and she was like, Josh Mankiewicz. You know, she pointed at you and oh. it was hilarious. So I just wanted to know if you filed charges. I guess no, not. No, no, no. <laughs> and usually, I mean, my contact with the audience is like, I don't even, I'm not even going to say it's 99% favorable. It's, it's 100% pleasant. Oh, yeah. I mean, I never have any trouble with anybody. No, people love you. And you, we saw Josh in action at Crime Economy. You really were, you must have been exhausted, by the way, but you handled every person that approached you with grace. You talked to everybody. Hey, you, look, I mean, this is like, you know, um, I mean, this is a business yeah. and those are the customers. If you ran a dry cleaner, and people came up to the street and said, hey, you know, I love the way you press my shirts. And you said, get away from me. You know, they wouldn't come back. Or shut yeah. them down. But I would say the other hosts are more reserved. You're definitely the one. I like meeting those people. That's your and personality. I like, yeah, I like meeting those people. Right. I like finding out what the audience is thinking. You know, for almost all of my career, you had no idea what the audience thought. There just wasn't any way of... Right, I mean, there's like, no outlet. I mean, you'd get like four letters a year from Did people. Did you ever get That's fan it. mail when people used to write? Oh, fan I mail. I mean, a little tiny bit, you How know, funny. like a couple. Yeah. But I mean, basically, no. Not like, you know, George Clooney or somebody like that got, you know, baskets of them or, you know. But you had to actually physically write a letter back Every in now the day. and then I wrote and then, it's, then it went to email. And mm-hmm. then instead of getting, you know, two letters a year, you got... 40 emails a year, but still not very much. Right. And now, of course, mm-hmm. hundreds of people can talk to you in real time every yeah. day, whenever they want. And that's great because you find out what they like, what they don't like. You find out, you know, when you're trying to put something over on them, when you're trying to do some little storytelling trick, you know, like we've discussed many times when we try to disguise whether somebody's in custody or not, mm-hmm. right? You find out how well that worked. You know, some people say, I knew it, I knew because of this, or I knew because of this. And some people say, I didn't know, you completely had me. It's great to get that kind of feedback from people. Right. And you're very active time. on your Twitter, too. That's how we met. That's right. That is oh, you met. are very witty on your Twitter. Mm-hmm. I look forward to your tweets. Yeah, I do, too. You, they're very so tongue-in-cheek so and enjoyable. Thank yeah. you. There's a couple of themes that, that, that uh, seem to be... She seems lovely she about seems, people. She seems... <laughs> Who are incarcerated and typically have are face tattoos. In tattoos. Yeah, they seem yeah. nice. Uh, robots, are gonna, be... robots are going to kill us. Um, <laughs> like somebody who's covered yeah. in tats, he's like, seems like a good one to bring home to yeah. mom. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Mom, dad, Mr. Wright. Yeah. <laughs> Mr. Wright. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, so I'm curious, just personality wise, like what's your biggest pet peeve? Do you have pet peeves or oh. just. Of people's personality? Yeah, or just even just not even a piece of what irks you? What's your biggest pet peeve in life? People driving too slow in front of me. Oh, you yeah. hate Florida. Right? Yeah. Yeah, I had road rage um, because they were so slow. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I lived in Florida at one point, yeah. What part did you do I, time in? Uh, I, I lived in, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was in Miami for about, it, not long, about, about two years. Okay. Yeah. I did Orlando. Uh, because I wasn't really ever there. I was, that's where my... I was at ABC then. Mm-hmm. It's where my furniture and my clothes were. But I was in Central America a lot of the time. And I was in the Mideast for a while. That was during the war duty days. Wow. Yeah. I've never been to Florida. Were you scared? I mean, are those scary assignments or? You mean in Florida? No. Yeah. I mean, Central America. Yeah. In, the in the trenches East. of Florida. Yeah, Florida was scary. A lot of uh, large insects. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was scared. Yeah, covering wars is not something I want to spend a lot of time doing. Right. Yeah, it was definitely – Mideast was definitely more frightening than the, than Central America. Right. Well, um, Josh – what, what are my pet peeves? Yeah, what's your pet peeve? I don't know. What irritates you most? Um, uh, you know, sometimes I watch, I watch our competition mm. and um, one of them I refer to as Brand X and the other one I refer to as Avis. Um, <laughs> and – and, and I see people do stories, and not just there, but I see it do. I see people do stories elsewhere, sometimes on on local news or on other broadcasts. And I think I could have done that better. They, yeah. you know, don't give away this fact two minutes in. You should have held that back. You got to challenge these people more. You know, don't just let them make a speech. One of the things that we're taught at Dateline is you have to challenge everyone in the story, not just. The people that are that are seen as adversarial, you have to challenge your sympathetic characters too. Yeah, um, and that's part of giving viewers the the whole clear picture, and it's part of not drinking anybody's Kool Aid. And I don't always see that. Yeah, and I, Dateline 
does a really great job of doing that. I mean, you really kind of keep people on their toes. Mm -hmm. I mean, of course, people are going to figure things out at some point, you know, during the show, but you don't give it all away in the beginning. No, we don't. And we're proud of that. I mean, well, that's, that's an art. It that, really is. That's the fun of doing this, which mm-hmm. is that you're telling a story. You know, we're ultimately bound by the truth. You know, we're not paying anybody. People are on Dateline because they want to be. And we draw a pretty strong and clear line between the story itself, which is frequently very sad, and the storytelling, which is kind of fun. I mean, we do not say, here is the story of, you know, Bill who was accused of murdering his wife, Mary, but it turned out it was actually Jim, the next door neighbor. Now, hang on for another 59 minutes while I go through this. Right. We start off a completely different way, but we get to the same place. And how we get there is frequently kind of fun, and it's it's part of the experience. Well, there's a reason why the show's been around so long. There's a mm-hmm. reason why you've been on there for 20... 23 years. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. That is almost unheard of. Yeah. It mm-hmm. is. Uh, TV, it is unheard of. Career. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's we're the awesome. longest we're the longest running primetime program on NBC, and we still can't get any paraphernalia sold in the biased and failing NBC store in New York, what? which just doesn't carry Dateline stuff. I think they have stuff on the website on the, but like if you go in the store, which is in Thirty Rock, and you say, "Where's the Dateline section?" They look at you like you know you're speaking Russian. You know, like we don't know. We don't we're also line. trying to get um, some sort of electronic petition to get Josh Mankiewicz to do the GPS voice. That's a, oh, with Waze, you know the way what? Did, that was yeah. a very good idea. That would be the only reason uh, that I would turn mine on because right. oh, I have 100%. it silenced right now because the um, the British accent, the woman, I mean, it's very pleasant. But I just unless it's Manx, I don't really want to hear it. Me neither. You just call just me up. I'll tell you noise. where to go. <laughs> yeah. I literally I call yeah. Manx. Yeah. Manx, where's the liquor store? Yeah, make a left. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. typically going to be liquor based. Yeah. Which so. left? <laughs> well, uh, Manx, it's no surprise that um, Carrie and I are very fond of you. We wrote not just a song. Yes, please. <laughs> Car- <laughs> Carrie's looking at like, me like, hold up. I know it's your. No, please. Um, no, please. Please. Podcast, but I had written down a, f- a couple of cases. I wrote down four cases, but two that I think we've talked about offline before. Um, and they're both Orange County cases Ooh. that I was hoping you could touch on. Okay. Uh, one was Tom and Jackie Hawks, which you covered. Right. So let's talk about that one, and then I've got a more current one I want to ask you about. And then please do because I'm gonna wrap curious it up about with a wrap. this too. Yeah, we got to wrap. Uh, Tom and Jackie Hawks uh, were killed by a guy who wanted their boat. Former uh, Power Ranger, the red one, I believe. It's oh, not really one. super clear whether he actually was a Power Ranger or not, because as you may recall, the people in the Power Ranger suits never said anything, and you never saw their faces. So he claimed to have been one of them. He might have been. Yeah. But who exactly was jumping around doing the sort of, you know, uh, the, 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 those moves uh, inside those, those we suits? Don't we don't know, because you never saw their faces. Right. Um, and it apparently was more than one person. Uh, at different times. But yeah, he claimed to be one of the Power Rangers. He claimed to be a lot of things, which are not, right. not to be true, which is one reason why we sort of were not sure about whether he was really a Power Ranger. Um, but he wanted to steal this boat so he could so he could run drugs with it, I think. Mm-hmm. And he got them to take him out on a uh, test cruise. This was a sort of a larger... It was called a yacht, but it really wasn't mm-hmm. what I think of as a yacht. It was kind of like a cabin cruiser or a, right. you know, a, a, I mean, it was a boat that you could sleep on, but it was hardly luxurious when we've seen okay. some of the other boats that, that are, you know, like, like apartment buildings and things. But it was a nice boat and he wanted to use it and he, uh, he got them to take him on a, a, a sort of test cruise and he brought a friend of his along who was actually a gang member but they took him to the gap and dressed him kind of inoffensively and said he was the accountant and then when they got out on the on the water they overpowered this couple did the wife come with the baby the wife the guy's wife Skylar de Leon's wife came with the baby to the dock okay. she wasn't on the and that and that, and that put, put the couple at ease. at ease because he's they saw a family man mm-hmm. with a young with a young infant got it uh, and they were selling it um, so, because so I think they were recent grandparents. They were going to move back to Prescott, Arizona yeah. and be with their grandkids. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. No, this is a horrible story. It's one of, those, one of the most awful stories that's ever on a daily. I think it only ran like once, I think. I don't think this is, this is not a story that's part of the Dateline repeats that you see on, uh, on Oxygen or Own mm-hmm. or ID. I don't think this one runs. Um, there's another one that doesn't run very often either, and I, I wish it would. So they overpowered them, like and the made couple. And made them sign over the boat, made uh. them sign power of attorney, or made them sign over the title. Jackie Hawks, I think, 
spelled her name wrong or put her wrong initial in, trying to signal that this was under duress. Got it. She did something to, to, to indicate mm-hmm. that, yeah, because I think she knew they were not coming back from that cruise. Yeah. And then they tied this poor couple to the uh, to the anchor and threw them overboard. Oh, Alive. Terrible. Yeah. And, oh, my uh, gosh. One of my uh, worst fears and, and, in life. And, uh, they said, I think, that they were holding hands, too. Yeah, no, it was a— oh. it When was, they found them, it, it was chills. It was one— that, that was that was one of the worst crimes. Okay, and, and, and this guy was conscienceless. Uh, he had to have been. Yeah. That's that's so personal. Yeah, this case so resonated brutal. in my mind. I remember back in the day when I sat um, would set my radio alarm to get up for work, and it went off. And I would listen to Power One Hundred Six. Uh, shout out to Big Boy back in the day. <laughs> But they were reading the news and they talked about – because I live in Long Beach at the time and this happened in Newport Beach. And they talked about this case and about them being thrown over alive. And I remember just waking up just being like, oh, my gosh, that story is horrific. And then seeing it covered and we talked about it. And then I think they said he had – Skylar had gender identity issues and he tried to cut off his penis in prison. Hmm. I'm not – we didn't talk with him about that. But I don't know whether he had gender identity issues or he simply thought that being in the women's prison was going to be easier than being in the men's yeah. prison because oh. he was a uh, he was a physically very small yeah. guy. Gotcha. Um, and, um, and and I think he might have thought that being in general population in the in the men's prison was going to be tough, which then he probably was right about. Probably right about. He that. Ro- he roped in too. He didn't he do a stint in Seal Beach and he got a security guard. I think there was a guy who was a trustee. Uh, right. Who was an inmate, but also like worked there. Was working off some time by working at the jail, and I think he had some part in it too. I think he enlisted that guy in the plan, and that's the guy who eventually cracked. Yeah, and told police what had happened. Newport Beach PD mm-hmm. um, cracked this case. They did an amazing job. There's some heinous crimes that have happened in Newport Beach. Well, one of the other ones I wanted to talk about was a recent one, Daniel Wozniak. Well, oh. that uh, that trial um, just ended. Right. Um, the the second trial of his girlfriend, uh, Rachel Buffett. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's a story you will be seeing on Dateline very soon. Oh, I cannot wait. So do you know this story? I don't, but that sounds Just a little pre- because preview. Uh, Dan Wozniak was an actor and an acting teacher, right, at a college? I didn't know if he was an acting teacher. I know he was in plays with his fiance. Uh, yeah, I think he taught acting as well as maybe like at a college or something. I'm not 100% sure about that. He was, he was definitely an actor and did like you know, dinner theater and yeah, like that kind of thing. Yeah, community theater, right. Um, and he wanted to steal money from a guy he knew, a, a friend of his who had served time in, uh, uh, in the military and built up a mm-hmm. lot of back pay. And so this guy had, you know, although he wasn't making a lot of money now, he had a fair amount of money saved up from when he was in uniform. And uh, this guy Wozniak wanted to steal his money. And the way he did that was he, he killed this guy. And then he used that guy's phone to send some text messages to a friend of the victim Mm -hmm. and get her to come over to his house. Then he kills the girl, whose name was Julie Kibuishi, Mm -hmm. leaves her there, stages it to make make it look like it might be some kind of sexual assault, Mm -hmm. which was weird because the victim and Julie didn't have that kind of relationship. Right. Um, and then disposed of the body of the uh, of the first victim, Sam Hare. I think and dismembered him. I think did, but yeah. mostly, but, but, but that was later. But I mean, yes. I think took him out of that place so that when people go looking for Sam, they get into his apartment and they don't find him, but they find the body of his dead friend. And so that set law enforcement off on the theory of. Sam killed Julie, and now Sam's in the wind somewhere. That's who we should be looking for. Right. When in fact he was also dead, but his body was hidden. I think that was the the dismemberment was part of hiding the body. Uh, eventually, that all played out because of the right. debit card. He right. paid mm. some kid to go take out four or five hundred dollars a day from like a Chase ATM in Long Beach to make it look like Sam was still alive. Yeah, right. and oh so they have gosh. cameras and stuff. They were able to track this kid down who would just skateboard up. Take money out, keep twenty bucks. Right, and they saw go the, home, and they, you know, the police, you know, they saw the, the the card being used, so they get the ATM footage, and they're like, "Who's that?" Yeah. It's obviously not Sam. Right. Um. I mean, this again, this was a guy who'd never committed a murder before, and you know, this was one of the critical mistakes because police found that guy, and through that guy, they found uh, Wozniak and Rachel Buffett, his girlfriend, mm-hmm. was accused of 
helping him sell that story, not of being involved in the homicide, either homicide, but of helping him sell the lie to police that Sam had been Mm -hmm. at his house and he'd been with some other guy. That was the story. He was with some other guy that I I didn't know, but they were together and then they came in together and they left together. So cops are thinking, okay, we need to find that guy, whoever Mm -hmm. that is. They go, I can't remember his name or... And she, according to prosecutors, she was involved in sort of helping sell that story that Sam was with someone else. Crazy. Muddying the waters. And so she went on trial and uh, uh, and was convicted just last week. They caught Daniel. He was at his bachelor party at a sushi restaurant. Oh, my gosh. Huntington I Beach. Forgot, I forgot of course. about yeah, that. That's and right. They brought him in in a Hawaiian shirt. And because Ugh. he's so right. theatrical, he was – I mean, his – you get to see the interrogation and he's just – You can tell it's such an act. He's like infuriating. And my guess is that theater nerds probably aren't going to do so well in prison. I would imagine. I would imagine. Another notorious crime that went down in the OC was the Dirty John. Yeah, uh, deal. One, yeah, and I know a, you all Dateline did a special. We did. On it yeah, that was uh, that was Keith, right? I don't remember who was did it. it. I just was know it I Amber? watched it either, was and it I did Amber? watch it. I can't remember. Yeah. It wasn't me. I, I can't remember which one. Of them, which I one. interviewed some of the girls. I interviewed um, John Meehan's first wife, Tanya Bales, his it's, daughter, uh, and then Tara Newell, and then most recently a lady named Kathy, who was sort of a friend. Uh, somewhat of a relationship with him at some point but i can't get enough of it the guy the guy was fascinating i mean true true so and then when you look at but, the pictures with it you know again i didn't cover that story but the question there's two questions one is like how could that guy do that to those people right, right? the second is how do all those women put aside their obvious suspicions I mean, like, real doctors don't walk around in scrubs all the time, particularly not filthy scrubs, right? right? How are you ignoring what is right in front of you? And that is a question that I could ask a lot of people who are on Dateline. Well, that's a fascinating thing, and I I think these are all intelligent women. I don't think it has anything to do. I think that when you are preoccupied because you want to be in love and you want to— it is or you, so or easy. Or you once were and you wanted yes. to go back to being that. Yes. yes. And you're lonely and there's all these things that play yeah. into it that it's very easy to and all you, of a sudden become and susceptible And you don't want to, to admit that you were wrong. You're exactly right. You know, uh, look, I mean, if, if, if I have one message for women in that situation, it is trust your instincts. If you think yes. that this yeah. is wrong, if you th- th- don't try to fix it. You know, if you feel fear from the guy that you're with or his stories aren't adding up and you feel in some kind of danger, don't think you're going to be able to make things right. Get out. And Look, women do want to fix. I mean, that is an yeah. And he started in um, secluding her from her children. Sure. Yes. The which children is, almost immediately. Which is what a lot of guys do. Yes. Yeah. That one fascinates me. And I know yeah. that there's a new uh, show coming out on Bravo Starring Connie Britton, all mm-hmm. about the Dirty John thing. And oh, is that right? It, yeah. That's a good idea. Who's playing Dirty John? It, it's it is um, some actor. Eric, um, Christian, no. I, Eric Bana? Yes. Okay. And he's very good looking. Yes, and I'm is. thinking that's a really good choice. Yeah. Uh, Connie Britton, I think, will be great uh, as Deborah Newell, too. So I'm curious to watch when they, it just When they see. finally make the Jamie Rice story, and they, <laughs> and they will... It's going to be Connie Britton. I, think. I just, yeah, I, I'm just going through the list of Academy Award winning actresses yeah. that would play me. I it just, it's, yeah, yeah. it's a long winning. list that, that would want to, I'm sure. Yeah. Who do you think would play me? Oh, <laughs> oh, hold on. I just had a flash. <laughs> it's almost, it's that girl, the Mean Girls movie, the one who says, where she goes, I have ESPN. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Instead yeah. of I have ESP. <laughs> who was that? Right. Oh, is that the girl from Party of Five? No. That's she's the one who said fetch. It's so fetch, you know, or you can't sit at our table. It's the blonde girl who Amanda was Seyfried? super ditzy oh, in well, the movie. Amanda Seyfried, who's a huge Dateline fan. Oh, shout oh, out to Amanda. Big, big, big. big, right big. Okay, yeah. I'll go Amanda. Sweet. She can play 20 years older. I'll go Amanda. <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, I can't remember her name, but she's the one who said I have ESPN. Big, but big, she big Dateline she fan. That's so something I can see I'd you say. saying that. <laughs> well. Is this the moment we've all been waiting for? Yeah. It, it, now, if we were stars before, this is Harry, gonna, this I hope is you're gonna, ready uh, to I'm, sign autographs anytime you're out on the streets and the grocery store because this is going to make us famous. I really feel that confident in our in our abilities. Do but, you? Yeah, have, oh, absolutely. Have the two of you rehearsed this? Uh, we actually haven't. <laughs> That's what's going to be so great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Oh. I rehearsed it to my husband in his first when I first got home yesterday. I, I wrote my version, my part of the rap like a month ago, and I sent it to right. Carrie, but I haven't touched it since then. So when I got home yesterday, I was like, oh, I should probably read this thing. So I read it in front of my husband. He saw it's mm-hmm. good. He's it's like, good. rhythm's a little off, so work yeah. on that. And I'm like, okay, okay. Right. So I have practiced like, a little I have to, bit. And then he's like, I have to go to my lawyer now. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And he's like, all of your self-respect, if you ever had any, has gone down the tube. I just want, <laughs> it's be interesting. Uh, please tell your husband I had nothing to do with this. Oh, I will. He knows me very yeah. well, and he knows that this was my doing. And he doesn't know you, but I'm going to blame it partially on Carrie. That's fine. That's, that's I a good blame. idea. <laughs> I can't that's, blame that's, for a lot of that's things. That's where I'd go. And yeah, most she'll, of them are my fault. Yeah, she'll take the blame. So, yeah, so we wrote a rap, and this is all about you, Josh, and we hope that you um, are honored by it. We hope you cherish you it. might be puzzled by parts of it. Slightly. Okay. But I'm going to go ahead and let Carrie – Carrie's going to start it off, and I'm going to end it. Mm, all right. I'm wondering whether I should uh... – are you texting someone? Um, I'm wondering whether <laughs> I am, I am texting West. someone, but I'm also kind of wondering whether I should record this. Well, I think so. I'm not sure I know how to I'm record thinking. this. We need to have um, evidence when he – well, he's going to need evidence when he puts a restraining order on us later. Yeah, that's true. Or tries to this. promote us as our manager, Easy Manx. This is true. <laughs> well, <laughs> Easy Manx. Easy Manx. That's nice. <laughs> So yeah, I'm thinking um, we should it it should be recorded. Okay. Um, I don't know how to do. Do that, you but, think uh, that our friend? Do you want to, or is that too? All right. Okay. Perfect. We've got a friend who's going to do. Oh, it. we have a friend who's going to do that. All yeah, right, we're yes, good. There we go. Okay, so I'm going to go first with mine. I'm all ears. <laughs> okay. Cruising down the five in his convertible, jocking the thugs, clocking the squares, went to the NBC office to get the scoop. Looking super fly in his three-piece suit. A car pulls up. Who can it be? It's not Keith, Andrea, or Dennis Murphy. Minx rolls down his window and started to say, it's all about finding that murder Kaye. Okay, some words I had to make up. Wow, that was good. Was oh, I'm not done yet. Because the people that murder are rarely hard. It's a jealous spouse, broke friend, or, or a lawyer that's been disbarred. Knowing nothing in life to be legit. Don't quote me, boy. You may not acquit. Josh M's in the place to give me the pace. He flies from town to town to bring us the case. Every Friday night, I look at the time. Come 9 p.m., I'm in my PJs watching Dateline. Got to be friends through the Twitter. Turned out that Michael Peterson is a switch hitter. Hooping with Keith, <laughs> hooping with Keith from dusk till dawn. Got to hang with the minx at Crime Con. Macking on the honeys just for sport. Until he met his wife-to-be in an airport. Don't let his look of dissatisfaction ruin your mind. A no-nonsense reporter, Minx is the bad boy of Dateline. Rushing home on a Friday night. Got big plans to feed my murder appetite. Got the remote in hand. Who else could it be? Only the best show on TV. It's the one, the only, greatest of all time. Ask me what I'm doing. I'm watching Dateline. Another who done it. Who could it be? The husband, the friend, or the secretary? Was it poison? <laughs> Plan? Did it get gory? Enter my boy Manx, he's got the story. He's allergic to bullshit, so perps don't dare. Step up to the dude who rocks a pocket square. Josh Mankiewicz, murder MVP, bad boy of Dateline, bringing style and swag straight to your TV. Catch me on a Friday, I'm not answering texts. The husband's story just cracked, I gotta see what happens next. Manx on the scene, making the husband sweat. Dude's face to face with the baddest TV host he's ever met. He's no match for the Manx because the Manx don't play. He calls the shots, makes killer husbands pay. He's a jet setter, but his roots are in L.A. Catch him riding dirty on the 405 freeway, top down. Carefree living, spend Friday nights with Manx, that's a given. He's the man, the legend, the one and only. Turn on Dateline and you won't be lonely. I'm proud to call him a friend and I gotta give thanks to the man, my boy, Josh Manx. Yay! We did it, guys. So, um... That's all about you, Josh. Have your kids, like, you know, gone without food for a week or something? Pretty much. Yeah, I was working you're on like, this for the past month. Like, Here's uh... some Pop-Tarts. Don't <laughs> don't bother Mommy. I'm like, leave me alone. I'm writing a rap for Manx, okay? Wow. Yeah, that was... Wow, Have we captured the essence of you? Uh, yeah, I, uh... Yeah. To quote Charles Foster Kane, you buy a bag of peanuts in this town, they write a song about you. <laughs> <laughs> or a rap. I finished mine as I was walking out the door. Which is pretty freaking spectacular. Which is kind of like what I do. I, I've had a boss who was like, you know, you sprint to the finish line. <laughs> I can tell it stresses you out. But it works. 
You are such a he, last minute Larry, but it what? always works out in her favor. Just like you fall into success, sort of. And I don't want to say that as a diss because you're very smart. No, I did fall into it. But no. you, it's like Guilty. it just happens Admittedly, for you. Admittedly, yeah. <laughs> it's like crazy. I was thinking to go towards Fox, but Dateline was the way to go, right. et cetera. Yeah. Yeah. It was the way to go, and I didn't want to do the crime originally. And then, like, turns out that's, like, been the greatest thing. Does Insane. it make you wonder, though, how much longer it will, like, kind of, I don't want to say be a fad, but be so heightened i mean i don't know it's certainly i mean i mean who knows but i mean it certainly certainly seems to be doing fine right now you know what i think though i think it's kind of like okay this is going to sound terrible but back in the day people didn't talk about things like uh child molestation they didn't talk about people being gay i mean as much as we do now i think that but it's always been there i don't think that we all of a sudden have more gay people or more child molestation i think it's always been there unfortunately, as far as the child molestation goes. But I think that the true crime thing, like the fascination, it's always been there. We just really have never no, no, there's made no it a question thing that until There's now. a way to talk about things that we never talked about before, and that's all the social media and things like podcasts. That didn't exist just a few years ago. Right. Yeah. I don't know. I, I started reading true crime books, I think, when I was like 12 Oh, my gosh. Yeah, I mean, I think, the, I think the interesting true crime Predates Dateline. I mean, you know, oh, there have yeah. been magazines and books and TV shows and movies all about things like that for a long time. And I don't, I don't think this, I don't think this genre is going anywhere. Right. Yeah. yeah. And probably just because of social media, there's just more of a heightened awareness. And and podcasting is a thing, at least for right now. Right. right? That's probably the thing that will die out first. <laughs> and we're probably going to help it. Actually, after this episode drops, it's going to be dead. <laughs> I, I do not know what to say about that song. That was uh, that was most impressive. Come on, easy. It was so, around. I mean, if we can convince you once we go offline to be our manager, that would be amazing. We'll talk contracts at lunch. Yeah. Sweet. So speaking of, let's get some chow. Let's get some chow. Let's plug our True Crime LA podcast meetup because that's going to be so much fun. So myself and Carrie and a bunch of our True Crime podcast host friends are getting together October 4th or 6th. It's October 6th. It's a Saturday at 4 p.m. So October 6th, Saturday, 4 p.m. We're getting together at this really cool bar where Gen Y actually uh, held their meetup a few months mm-hmm. ago, which I went to. And so I stole their spot because it was great. And what bar is this? Um, Idle Hour. I think it's in North Hollywood. It is on Vineland Avenue. So it will be the cleaning of John Doe, murderish, what? Murderous minors, white wine, true crime, yep. pretty scary, the pros and cons, crime, and a bunch more. Yeah. Oh, wow. So an end Manx, if you're around, if I'm we here, would love for you to come join us. If I'm us. here, I'll be there. We would love it. Yeah. That'd if be I'm awesome. In, if it. I'm in town, I'll come over. <laughs> awesome. All right, guys. I think that's a wrap. Literally, that's a wrap. <laughs> thank you both so much. No, Josh. Oh, thank you. The pleasure you. is uh, all Dateline, ours. Dateline every Friday, 10 p.m. Eastern, 9 p.m. Central Time, unless we're doing two hours, which I think we're about to do some more of. Good. Um, I love those. And where can people find you on social media, Manx, as if uh, they don't know already? Um, I mean, I'm on uh, Facebook and Twitter, both as Josh Mankiewicz. You need to get on the gram. I know. I know. I, I don't know if I can do one more platform. <laughs> it literally, social media is- Get rid of Facebook, then. It's to be a little exhausting. All right, guys, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Let's get some chow. Well, guys, I hope you enjoyed this episode as much as I enjoyed recording it. Josh is such a great sport, and I always have a blast recording with Carrie. Don't forget to tune into Dateline NBC on Friday nights and subscribe to the White Wine True Crime and Pretty Scary podcast to hear Carrie in her element. Thank you, Josh and Carrie, for a great time. Can we do it again soon? Like tomorrow, maybe? All right. I also want to thank Ariel and Vincent from Westside Village Workspace for providing such a great studio for us to record in. Vincent, the sound engineer, went above and beyond his duties and recorded part of our session on his phone, and he took some great action pics, too. I'll post some of those pictures in the Facebook group, and I'll also post a video that Vincent recorded on his phone of Carrie and me performing our rap to Manx. Oh, and you guys, I have a really fun game coming your way. Be on the lookout for a new episode in the Murderish feed titled Name That Podcast. What you're going to hear is a mashup of a bunch of podcast hosts reading a quick line, but they won't identify themselves. Here's how the game works. For a chance to win a really cool prize to be announced later, you have to listen to the Name That Podcast episode and then name as many hosts as you can just by hearing their voices. So have a pen and paper ready to see how many podcasts you'll be able to recognize. 
The Name That Podcast game will be available on Murderish soon, so keep your eyes peeled. If you're enjoying this podcast, take a minute to follow us on social media. Search Murderish in Facebook to join a fun group of like-minded people who discuss all things Murderish. Also, follow Murderish on Instagram at Murderish Podcast and on Twitter at Murderish Pod. Do me the biggest favor and hit the subscribe button in your favorite podcast app. Tell a friend about Murderish and leave a positive rating and review in iTunes. If you'd like to take your support for the podcast a step further, head over to patreon.com slash murderish. You'll see some cool perks that are available in exchange for your monthly support. If you become a show patron, you'll have immediate access to exclusive bonus content, which includes some fun conversations with other true crime podcasts and a follow-up to my most downloaded episode to date, Stranger in My Bedroom. You'll also have the opportunity to get some murderish swag as part of your Patreon reward package. Murderish merch is available at two online stores, so if you'd like to sport a murderish t-shirt or sip coffee from a murderish mug, go to the About section in the Murderish Facebook group where you'll find links to both merch stores. You can also find links to the merch stores in episode show notes. Shoot me an email with any comments or questions you have to murderishjamie at gmail.com. That's murderishjami at gmail.com. This show is mixed and mastered by John Buchanis of Audio Editing Solutions. Music for the show was composed by Nico of We Talk of Dreams. I hope you'll stick around for a couple more minutes to hear promos from some of my pod friends. I've found so many great podcasts after hearing their promos played on other shows. I hope you'll find something new to binge on. As always, thank you for listening, and I'll see you all very soon. The Casual Criminalist is a new podcast. It's true crime casually done. We have a bit of a laugh at how generally incompetent criminals can be and how sometimes the people trying to catch them just are much better. Whether it's writing down crimes in a serial killer diary, trusting the police that they definitely can't trace that phone call, or just bragging about all your murders to your friends down the pub. The Casual Criminalist covers it all and mocks it all. Join me, your host, Simon Whistler, and listen to The Casual Criminalist on the iHeartRadio app, on Apple Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts.